So Hola. I'm going to sh share my screen um, and going to ask that, that while I'm kind of presenting, you probably keep your uh, microphones on mute. Uh, if you've got any questions and things, if you pop them into the chat for me, that would be lovely. And then hopefully, as long as we, we keep Natalie with us, she's a bit worried about popping in and out tonight. But uh, if we keep her with us, she'll, she'll uh, chirp up with any questions and things we've got to talk about. Uh, there's a couple of places where I may we'll stop and, and we'll, um, we'll just have a chat through things that uh, might be helpful to you. So what we're doing is very much looking from an athlete's perspective. And I respect that we've got quite a few coaches with us as well. Some people who are athletes and coaches together. So obviously, if your your coach is on this, be thinking about how you're going to put this stuff across and prepare your athletes to have this kind of knowledge. Uh, from, and athletes particularly, really welcome to see you tonight. And uh, I hope you'll find this um, very useful. Now, I hope I'm now showing you a lovely purple page. Athletes working with officials. Have we got thumbs up? Can we see that? Lovely. Thank you very much. So I really wanted to, to start from the point of view of um, thinking about athletes. And we talk about performance behaviours. And it's something when we're looking at our more elite athletes that we're trying to get a really rounded view of an athlete. So it's not just about your ability to propel a ball onto the court. And it's not just about... Um, your your understanding of tactics but actually there's more to being a botcher player the holistic botcher player um, and under the we divide into sort of physical elements which are to do with your fitness and your strength and power and balance and body control and so on we talk about technical and tactical so how to throw a ball and where to throw it pretty much and then we also talk about mindset and some of the performance behaviors we talk about within the mindset area of a player profile um, will include some of the follow, following. So these are things that you maybe don't have to have a great knowledge of. But actually, they're really going to help you when you get into a comp competitive situation. And these are the things that the better botcher players are doing all the time. They have this really rounded knowledge of everything. So we're going to be looking at a little bit about your understanding of the rules and how to apply them. Um, we're going to be thinking about your botcher equipment and readiness for play and for inspection. Um, it was interesting when we were doing the talk with um, the referees, our officials, that over half of all of the violations are sports assistants breaking the rules. And yet, of course, 100% of the violations will go against the player. I think that was a really interesting point and one which we, we might need to think about a bit more, making sure, particularly those of you that um, use a sports assistant, have a COVID assistant for the first time, or have a, lots of changes of assistants. Um, I think it's really important that you prepare them all well so that they basically don't let you down. And then also a little bit about effective personal and game management. So how do you control your, um, your feelings on the court, your attitude when things perhaps aren't going so well or whatever, that can be related to how well you perceive the rules being um, implemented. Or if you think things are a bit unfair, something's happened that doesn't favor you at all. Uh, how can you manage yourself then? And that ability to win and lose with grace ability to go off court at the end of the time thinking I've done well even though I might have lost or accepting things haven't gone your way oh, that one so officials well they really come under these headings we don't very often think of classifiers but they are officials so I'm going to talk a little bit about classification as well because I think it's something that people don't always fully understand but our referees, liners and timers are the people you're most likely to interact with as an athlete um, more of the time. So we'll think a bit about those. And uh, at international level, we have something called a technical delegate. That's somebody who is appointed by the um, world botcher or BISFED as it was um, to oversee a competition. And um, 
to make sure that everything run, abides by the rules. And if anything doesn't, the technical delegate has to decide how the rules will be applied or what new rule will be made up for that. Uh, and you might be interested to know that I think we're very lucky with our um, Botcher England um, competitions that Rachel actually is an te international technical delegate. So you have somebody of that really top quality that's running and organising competitions in Botcher England. Um, perhaps we don't celebrate that often enough. So a little bit about classifiers, because this might be the first official that you come across when you come to a competition. It's your first competition. There's usually some form of classification at that competition. Ideally, it will be done before you get into competition, but actually quite often at a lower level, it's done during the competition at some stage. And it's redone as you go up the um, uh, layers, tiers, if you like, of competition. So we have our own local competitions where there might be no class uh, classification at all. We then have our Botcher England regionals where you'll probably meet classifiers for the first time. And you might not see them again until you qualify for a national event. So that might be the national finals of the Heathcote Cup or the BE Cup. At that point, you'll see a slightly bigger panel of classifiers, and that will give you a national classification. And again, you might then not see classifiers again for a long time until you get to international level. So that's not the friendly internationals that some of the England squad will have been to, um, or indeed Irish or Scottish, um, but that would be an international that um, Bocce UK would be taking our Great Britain team to. So those are really the three key times that you would be classified. Now, having said that, you would receive as a result of that either something called a confirmed status or a re review status. So if you have a condition which is, is set, it's not going to change at all, you might be given a confirmed status. Um, but if you have a condition that is likely to change, either because of your age, which can influence um, what happens with your condition um, or whatever. If your condition is likely to change, you might be on permanent review status. So that means that we expect to see the classifiers again every now and then, and they will decide when that's likely to be. You usually, I think, don't see classifiers uh, more than once in a year. So uh, it's got to be at least a year between. I don't want to get heavily into that. I just want to start you thinking about classifiers being officials and what you can do as athletes to prepare yourself for those officials. The first thing is get the paperwork ready. So when you're called for classification, you'll often be asked to bring paperwork with you. Just get yourselves organised. Um, if you're a coach with an athlete, you might not see what the athletes get via the botcher base. So, um, it, but it's just good to be asking them the questions. Have you got all your paperwork ready? Have you done everything you need to do? Um, is there anything I can help with? Uh, because if you arrive for classification, you haven't got the things you've been asked to bring, they can't classify you. You do need to take everything with you that you use to play. So if you wear a glove in order to throw a ball, then that has to be approved by the classifiers. Uh, the same if you use a ramp, a uh, head point, uh, hand point, anything like that. Um, and you have to take in the ramp that you play uh, with, the balls, uh, the wheelchair that you sit in when you play, all those things. And the classifiers will look at all of that as well. Now, those classifiers will usually be uh, medical and technical. So national uh, level onwards, you'll have both. You'll definitely have a, a medical and a technical classifier, and you'll very often have three classifiers. So the medical is somebody does what it says on the tin, might be a doctor or a physiotherapist, somebody with medical background. Technical classifiers have background within sport, so they know botcher. And those, those two people together can bring everything they know to help to get your classification done. And there's two parts to classification always. There is the physical exam, which you do in a private room where they might ask you if you're able to sit on a plinth and do some things or to sit in your chair. They might ask you to throw or propel balls. Um, but whatever they come, whatever decision they come to in that room, they also have to watch you on court to decide finally what your classification can be. So it is possible to come out 
with one classification be observed on court and then they can change your classification to something different. So those two parts are really key. And I think um, both coaches and athletes need to understand that just from being seen in the room, you won't have a confirmed classification. Um, you will need to be seen in competition as well. So the other thing that we're doing in advance is preparing for equipment checks. Um, and I just wanted to raise that the in the new rules, there's going to be equipment checks in the call room, for, well, sorry, ball checks in the call room, as well as before the competition starts. So usually at a um, Heathcote Cup, when you start out, it's a nice friendly competition, you may well not have equipment checks. But as you get up to maybe Heathcote Cup finals or you start with the Botcher England Cup, um, I don't know what point this would be in uh, Northern Ireland, but perhaps if somebody does know, they'd like to pop that in the chat for us as well so that you can help each other there. But we start to have call rooms and we start to have equipment checks. And usually you take your equipment to be checked on the night before the weekend of the competition. So on a Friday night, maybe on the Saturday morning. Um, and what's really important to know is that strong advice would be take more equipment than you use because it's very, very easy. We actually had it up in Largs. One of our players been playing for two years, of course, without really seeing anybody or going to a competition. I'd be using his jack ever such a lot, got to competition and his jack uh, failed the roll the um, roll test so actually he had to play with somebody else's jack which was quite a difficult thing to do at a major competition because his had been used so much so particularly as we're coming back into competitions now where we're going to have equipment checks take spares so that particular player didn't have any spares with them um, and it's a really good idea to always have spares so you'll see at a major competition some players will bring three sets of balls to the equipment check they might bring two head pointers, you know, whatever, they get everything checked. So there's also usually there'll be ball check equipment sort of outside the call room somewhere. But the new rule is that when you're in the call room, there will be equipment checks on the balls. Um, so we've got to see how that plays out yet. Yeah, that'll be down to our referees. Um, but that's one of the first things. Now, you know, I said that you can take to equipment check as many balls as you want. When you go into the quorum, absolutely make sure that you only take one set of balls. So it can be a mixed set like you can see on the picture, but you can't have more than six blue balls, six red balls and one jack ball. Otherwise, one of your first interactions with your referee will be them giving you a card because you've taken too much equipment into the quorum. So moving on to our referees and liners and timers, our officials, just a few things to point out before we start talking about the things that we are hoping as athletes that they will do. We need to remember they are always volunteers. Even at international level, they are volunteers. Uh, even at Paralympics, they're volunteers. And we have a great training programme in this country that again isn't mirrored all around the world. There's a few countries with a fantastic training programme like us, but not many. So our level one officials will have attended a, a one day course. Um, at schools level, they may have um, attended a course where maybe an hour is based on officiating. Um, our level twos then get, enter a mentored programme where we really support them and help them along. So they're learning. I think that's important to remember that, you know, you're not born a referee and you don't absorb all the rules and know how to deliver them all just because you've got that title or you've got a, a Botcher England top with referee written on it. Um, so everybody has to learn and that's the, the mentoring is about that as well. And we go on to level three, which are our nationals and level four are internationals. And again, in this country, we've got seven or eight internationals and across UK, we've got even more international referees. And again, that's a really high number, probably only Portugal and maybe Spain have got more than us. So we're very lucky with the standard of refereeing here. But you know, something that, that came out of my discussions with um, Steve, one of our international referees, is he said, officials are rarely thanked and often blamed. And I thought, 
well, you know what, it must be athletes and coaches that aren't thanking them and often blaming them. So I kind of want to take that on because I'm really grateful for the officials that, that come and volunteer their time. And maybe we just forget because we're so busy and, you know, focused on winning our, our matches and that kind of thing. So just maybe something to think about and, and the remembering that please and thank you go a long way. <laughs> So in a straightforward end, let's just think about the things that happen um, from a, a, an athlete's perspective. So you might have met your athlete in the quorum, sorry, your referee in the quorum, but actually you might just meet, meet them um, on the court as well. Um, and what we would be expecting is that they're going to check that they've got the right players. That's the first thing. And they're going to do the coin toss. And the winner of the coin toss is going to decide which colour balls to play. Um, you're then going to go into red in box three and blue in box four. It's not only the official's um, responsibility to get you in the right box, but they should be checking. Uh, but I know quite a few of us have seen matches played in the wrong boxes, which has always been interesting. <laughs> um, just recorded on here, we've got team matches, obviously, in the league. We've got red in boxes one, three and five and blue in boxes two, four, and six. And what we should see is that our referee then positions himself off the court on the red side, because the red is always the first to throw the jack. And they're off the court because they don't know where you want to th th throw the jack. So if the referee is still on the court, it might be exactly where you want to throw the jack. So that's why we move off the court first. And they should ask for jack, please. And once that jack has been positioned, the referee generally moves at that time. And where they'll go to, you'll see them not halfway between the player and where the jack ball is, but about two thirds of the way from the player and about a third of the way from the jack ball. And they will be about two strides to get into the pathway. So they want to be out of the pathway that the player's playing the ball along, but within two steps or a quick wheel of the wheelchair or a quick drive, they want to be able to intercept that ball if something is not quite right about the throw. That's why we see referees in that position. So when we see lots of matches and everybody's set short right, we'll see all the, the referees in the same position all the way down on all the courts. Um, and that actually is one of those things that sometimes when we go abroad, we don't see that sort of discipline, something actually that we're pretty good at and something we try and coach early on, because if the referee is in the good position, they can intercept the ball. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have a liner, the liner is usually kind of diagonally opposite to the referee. So if the referee is in the front to the um, left of the red player, then the liner is likely to be in the back to the right of the blue player. So they're diagonally opposite. And what that means is the liner can see the things that the referee can't see. So when you feel that liner moving around the side or the back of where you're playing in the athlete playing boxes, if they're moving in order to get the view of all the things that the referee can't see. As you can imagine with its BC3 players particularly, or players with, with you know, quite big wheelchairs, there's quite a lot that the referee can't see from their side of the court. So that liner is trying to think, what can't the referee see? And therefore, what must I be able to see? So um, play obviously will continue red and blue, you all know about that. Um, until we get to the end. But let's see what else might happen. Oops. So here we have our red and blue players coming into court. Just got to move my pictures of people away a bit more. Um, there's a little bit more activity on this slide than I wanted to show you. But when I went to try and take out some of the bits and pieces, uh, it was a bit, little bit beyond my computing capabilities. So we're going to have a bit more here than I wanted. I've nicked this from um, a, a official's award. So here we are, it's red to play. So that red dot is, is showing you the paddle, 
that it's red to play. And red is given the jack ball and red propels the jack ball onto court. So what we'll be seeing here, if you can imagine, um, maybe sort of look on your screen, that probably if I took a line from the red player to the jack, actually where that crosses the V line is probably about two thirds from the player and a third to the jack. Um, and the jack is actually sort of towards the middle. So uh, it's about one and a half to two meters in from the sideline. So we might see the referee stand on the court now, but they're gonna stand on the court so that they're not between the player and the jack. And within two of their steps, and remember we've got some tall referees and some short ones, some agile ones and some not so agile ones. So they will decide how far out of that line they need to be in order to intercept the ball if they needed to. Okay. Am I describing that well enough for everybody? Good, thank you. I can see a thumbs up from a couple of people there. Right, now we get some interesting things because we're going to show you some um, jacks that aren't legal and I'm not really going to talk about them. Uh, but if you want to look and perhaps think to yourselves about uh, what you've seen here, that would be good. Oh, where are we? So there you go, that's not a legal jack. I'm not going to tell you why, hope you know. That's not a legal jack either. Oh, I hope you've seen the red player there because that's not a legal jack either. And what's happened there is because the red player's ball was legal, blue has been given the jack next. Now, interestingly, if the red player doesn't get the jack onto court or throws it out of court, they get another go because Oh, no, they don't. That's wrong. Sorry. It's if they throw the first coloured ball out of court. I can't remember what this goes on to. Oh. Stop, Sandra. Rewind. Ignore that bit. <laughs> so right and wrong. On the picture on the left taken in Beijing, that is a liner. And they're standing looking along the front line um, because probably the referee it might be quite a long way away and they are checking that maybe the gentleman's foot doesn't go on the line as he propels the ball. So the liner is on that side. We expect the referee to be on our side of the picture and further up. And if we look on the right side, anybody who's been to um, school competitions may very well have seen this because this is what we shouldn't be seeing. So we've got a volunteer referee here who's standing behind the jack. The only reason for doing that would be if you had a visually impaired player. And then actually you probably, you might be showing the paddle, but you would also be talking about. So that's another thing. But what we should be seeing is where the gentleman is at the side, that might be somewhere over there that we'd want our referee to be. So again, we've got that two thirds from the player, a third from the jack. At the moment, the player holding the paddle could not intercept a ball that was thrown, say, if the player had the, their wheel on the line. That's why that's not a good position. So which rules are most often broken by less experienced athletes? And actually, I wonder if it is less experienced or if it's all. Um, so here we go. Not being entirely within your box. So you know you have to be inside the lines. In botcher, being on the line is out. Um, playing before the paddle has been shown. So before somebody's indicated red or blue to play, the, the ball is thrown. Preparing to play in the opponent's time. So a typical one is somebody trying to line up or somebody uh, picking their ball up and starting to roll it and round it. That is preparing to play in your opponent's time. Um, big one at the moment, partly because of COVID assistants who aren't trained in the same way maybe that sports assistants have been, and that's inappropriate communication. 
So that can be between a player and a coach. It might be the coach is off court and they're trying to coach. That would be inappropriate. Could be between a player and a sports assistant when it's not their time to play. And by the way, in the new rules, um, BC1s have sports assistants, BC3s have ramp operators. So when you see SA and RO, that's how it's put in the new rules. So if you want to go and have a look and read them, expect to see those two um, initials. <laughs> um, one of the other things is assistants that turn too soon or assistants and coaches that enter the court too soon. So very often that's in the minute between ends or it's before the um, score has been announced and agreed. So the referee can announce the score, but until it's been agreed, the, the assistants shouldn't be turning to look on the court. They should wait until they hear that minute and then they can turn and look. And the other big thing, the other big rule that is broken quite often is balls actually failing the equipment tests. It's another really good reason to have extra balls with you, to get them tested regularly, and to know that if one fails a test, you know which, which one's the next one to go in to your um, set. So knowing all that, I'm not going to go into all of the rules, but there are two or three kind of general things we can say about the rules. Um, and to get to know them better, you've got to go to the bottom point, you have to read them and you have to get to know them. And actually one of the things that I think is really good is that we, those rules that are broken most often, let's, let's get our athletes to know that early on. Um, and athletes, hopefully you know, you knew all those rules that I talked about then. If not, go and have a look at those ones in particular. Um, but actually when we're in training and things happen, that's the time to look up the rules. When you get something happening, you think, ah, oh, I'm not really sure what happens. There's, two of us in the team through at the same time, what do we do now? That's the very time to get the rules out and have a look. They're online, then I haven't looked, I imagine Botcher England has got the new set online now, but they're certainly on the World Botcher. There's a new set, which is from 2021 to 2024. That's the group you need. So if you had them, you've got them on your laptops already, you need to replace them with the, the new set of rules that starts in 2021. Um, but there's, a few things that we can say. So if a violation occurs whilst throwing the ball or whilst releasing the ball down the ramp, the ball will be retracted. So if you have your foot on the line, for instance, that ball is gonna be taken away. So if, if in the moment that you let go of the ball, you are doing something wrong, the ball will get taken away. That's what a retraction is. And you see this sign sometimes uh, of somebody coming down, I'm going to retract the ball. If you do something wrong, but there's no ball being thrown, then clearly we can't retract it. So in that case, it leads to a penalty. So that's when your opponent is going to get a penalty ball at the end of the end, and they get a chance to score an extra point by getting it into the penalty box. So that kind of violation might be something like, um, if you were talking to your sports assistant during the other player's turn. So clearly you're not throwing any balls at that time, but you've talked, spoken at the wrong time um, and it's perhaps distracted your opponent, that could lead to a penalty ball. But there are many violations that lead to both. So you get a retraction and a penalty ball. I've just put the numbers here. So if you're looking through the rules, the rules are 15.7.1 to 15.7.8. Okay, so there are eight things that lead to not only losing the ball you threw, but also giving your opponent a penalty ball. And if we go back to the things that we said were really, really commonly done, not being inside the lines, one of the most common rules that broken and yet, if you do that, you'll lose the ball and you'll give away a penalty. So there's, there's quite a lot, isn't it, to happen for that. If your ramp is overhanging the front line, it doesn't matter if it's touching or not, the ramp is never allowed to overhang the front line. And if that happens, you'll get a retraction and a penalty. And finally, if your ramp operator looks onto the court as the ball is released, you will also get a retraction and a penalty. 
So there are others. I'm going to leave it to you to go and look at the other ones. But there's three things there straight away that can happen quite a lot of the time. So it's really, really important that you understand those and you understand what can happen. And it's important so that you don't do it, but also so that you understand if your opponent has done it. So there are times when you might spot a rule infringement. So you might spot something that the referee hasn't spotted. Do you remember when I talked about the liner being in the opposite side or sort of diagonally opposite to the referee? Well, imagine now most, you know, lots of our competitions, we don't have the ability to have liners as well. So imagine you've got, you've sat quite a long jack perhaps, and the referee's up in one corner, towards one corner, and something happens behind the player on the edges that they can't see. But you're sitting beside that so you can see it. So a great example would be you can see that the opponent's wheel or maybe part of their ramp extension or something is on the line when they throw. You can see that. So you know there's something wrong. You know they're not allowed to do that and that should be a violation. But are you aware that you can't draw the referee's attention to it in your opponent's turn? So this is really, really important. So the time to do it is in dead time or in your own time. But clearly, if you do it in your own time, you're then using some of your precious time to explain what's happened before. So the ideal time is dead time. And dead time is after the th thrown ball has stopped rolling, or if it goes out of court, it's the point where it crosses the line. At that point, you can put your hand up or you can ask your assistant to put their hand up to get the referee's attention, okay? If you don't do it then, and the ball stops and the referee immediately indicates for your opponent to play again, you can't say anything about it. That time has passed. So as an athlete, you've got to be really quite attentive to that if you think it's something that's happening. Having said that, you may have drawn the referee's attention to it, but actually you have to remember that the referee can only judge what they see. So if you saw that the back wheel was on the line, but they're actually diagonally opposite and they can't see that back, back wheel, the referee will say, you know, thank you for drawing my attention to it. Um, I wasn't able to see it at that time. What that might do, so there may be no violation, you might not get a penalty ball because the referee hasn't seen it. But the fact you've drawn the attention of the referee to it, and you also obviously said that in front of your opponent, both of them may realise that you've spotted the infringement and it probably won't happen again because the player's probably not going to do it again and the referee is going to be on the lookout for it. So just be aware of that. If you are raising the referee's attention to something, it doesn't mean that it will be given as a violation if the referee hasn't seen it. Are we getting any questions or anything at the moment? Natalie? One just come in from Ian about foot plates. Mm -hmm. in or out of the box Raf has just come back allowed to overhang may be asked to move if in the way yeah Anything really, to add on really that good one? question actually because where we said that the ramps aren't overhang allowed to overhang the foot oh, no. yeah the front line the throwing line um actually foot plates are so in the case of um any thrower or kicker you can have your foot plates over the line as long as your wheels or anything else isn't over the line. The one thing to be wary of is if you're wearing shoes with laces, because if your lace becomes undone and your foot plate is over the line and the lace hangs and, and drops onto the court or touches the court in front of the throwing line or indeed on the throwing line, that would be part of your equipment out of the court. I know that's pretty tough, <laughs> but you have to be aware of that, okay? So 
foot plates can go over the line, ramps can never go over the line. It's one of the few rules that are different for rampers and throwers. Um, and was there was a second thing as well there? Or was that just Raf's reply? Yeah, just the, yeah. The, the chat about that really. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Sandra. Lovely, okay, thank you. So resolving issues. So sometimes you might disagree with your referee about the way they've handled a situation um, or about the way they've applied a rule or scored an end. There's various things. And I'm going to go back to that fact that our referees, we have referees in training as well as referees who have international standard. So it is understandable that we don't always get everything right all the time. And as athletes, I know we don't get everything always right all the time. And as a person, I definitely don't always get everything right all the time. <laughs> so we, we need to be understanding of that. But actually, if you think that you might have been disadvantaged by it, then you do need to maybe ask if you can't resolve it with the referee, then you probably need to politely ask to speak to the head referee. And this is something now in the new rules where you need to be aware that you have to resolve all issues on court during the game now. There are no um, protests. There is nothing after the game. Um, everything has to be resolved on court during the game and then signed at the end and that's it. Once the, game, once the match is over, it's finished, it's done with. You can't protest, you can't do anything else. So if you really feel that something hasn't been done correctly and it, and it means that maybe you're going to get less points or you're not going to get penalty balls, you should, or it's given your opponent an advantage over you, um, then you can ask to speak to the head referee. Now, when the head referee comes over, they should come to you and ask what the issue is. So you've spoken with the referee, you don't feel it's resolved, you've asked politely, can I speak to the head referee? They'll come and ask you what the issue is. And you then need to explain what you think has happened and why you've asked to speak to them. Okay, so try and be as calm as you can and, and be as clear as you can about what has happened. So just explain, this happened first, do it in order, this is what I saw, this is what happened, this is what I think should have happened, and this is why I've asked to speak to you. Um, as we, the head referee, so I've got Steve here um, in his head referee top, I think, um, and he will then ask your referee what has happened. And at that point, he's very likely to move back to the end of the court and to do that privately. So you probably won't be able to hear what they're saying. And he will ask the referee from their point of view what they think has happened as well. The head referee may come and ask you more questions or they may formulate their response straight away. So you don't know what's going to happen. The referee might have said, oh, yes, I did do that, actually. And, and I'm not sure if that was the right thing to do. And it'll be sorted out. But what will happen is the head referee will tell you what their decision is and they'll tell you how the game is going to continue. Um, so it might be, um, I understand that you saw your opponent's wheel was on the line. Unfortunately, the referee wasn't able to see it and doesn't have a liner to assist. So on this occasion, we can't uphold that. However, we will be looking out for it in the future and thank you very much for helping. We're just going to carry on the game now as usual. Or it might be that you've seen your time running down in your opponent's time. So you've just lost two minutes, something like that. And when you go to the referee, they're not sure what to do. So you ask them to get the head referee over to help. And the referee says, yes, it did run down. I'm not quite sure what to do now. And the head referee will just help. The referee and the timer to sort that out, put your minutes back on. They'll come and tell you about it. This is what we've done. We've added the two minutes back on and we're going to carry on playing. So you should always get that explanation of what has happened. OK, and the decision of what you're going to what's going to happen next. Now, from a player's point of view, you have to remember that when you think you've seen something that isn't fair, what is going to be the effect on you? So can you stay calm? Because if you think 
that wasn't fair. I know that happened. And the referee hasn't upheld it. And the head referee hasn't. I feel terrible now. I'm really angry. Well, actually, that's not going to help you with the rest of your play. There's very few players that play best when they're really angry. Actually, what you need to do is to stay calm. So it's that thing of you have to accept when the head referee or the referee has said something, you have to go, OK, you know, I might I know that I saw it. I understand that they can't uphold it. I understand it's got to go on. I'm going to put draw a line under that now and I'm going to carry on to play to the best of my ability. That's quite a big skill to be able to do that. And particularly we've got some of our athletes that may have learning disabilities or behavioural issues. That's going to be a really hard thing for them. So as a coach, I think you need to think about how you prepare athletes. You know, actually it's quite a high level skill to prepare an athlete to call a violation against, or, you know, to see a violation that somebody else has done. You wouldn't expect your beginners to be doing that because it's, it, it's, there's too many things around that. But I think it comes hand in hand with this, how do we stay calm? How do we manage to still play our best botcher, even though something has happened that we're sure isn't fair to us, but actually we've got to accept that decision. So staying calm is important. Remaining polite is really important because otherwise you can get a yellow or red card, quite a fact, apart from the fact that we should all remain polite all the time. And we really do expect, and I'm talking now from a point of view of being an, an England coach, etc. we expect to see athletes shaking hands at the end of the match, perhaps not during COVID conditions, obviously, we do other things and thanking your officials for their service. So thank your referee, thank your timer and your liner because they've given their time to come and help you. Even if you don't like what happened, you should still be doing those things. Again, any, any questions or comments arisen there? There's a question coming from Paul about um, collecting balls at the end of the at the end of the end in relation to COVID. Um, what I'd say on that, Paul, is just to to check with whoever's hosting the competition directly before it happens. I know in England we've been using COVID assistance when we had our September competition but all of these COVID guidelines are being reviewed regularly um, so what stands now might not be in place in another in another six months so whenever you are competing depending on who's hosting that event um, just double check what guidelines are in place um, at that time but certainly we're not trying to make it difficult or trip no. anybody up so the support the right support will be there for you at, at any given time. And actually uh, my last slide is about COVID assistance because that's the one that everybody's new to having a COVID assistant as well, you know, so um, I will, I will go on to that. Good question though. So we've got to the end of the end and we've got some balls. Excuse the fact that they're not red and blue, but apparently I only had pink and purple available. <laughs> so I've got two situations here. The black is the jack. Um, and because I've got you all along the side of the edge underneath me, you can't see something. I'm just going to I'm just going to move you guys back over to the side again, or not? Okay. Um, so if we've got a jack, a, a red ball, which is the pink one you can see, and a purple ball or the blue one you can see, and we want to the first thing we're going to do is is have a visual check to see can we see which ball is closest. So this could be during an end or it could be at the end of an end and ideally the referee will get right over the top of those if you can see the the line with the arrow I've got uh, running down here um, actually at the bottom of that I can't see it because I've got all your faces underneath but I've got a box that says referee so what I expect the referee to be if you like dividing the angle there you go, I got it in there for the maths. Dividing the angle for between the two um, coloured balls and standing on the opposite side of the jack to those two coloured balls in line with that dividing line. And now if you look down as we are looking straight on those three balls, it's quite easy to see that red is closer than blue or pink is closer than purple. <laughs> um, so I think this is the first thing that referees should do is a visual 
um, measure. Now, sometimes you can't get on top. So if we look at the one on the right hand side, um, we've got our, our pink and then our black and then our purple. Actually, if we imagine that there may be um, two metres apart between the two coloured balls, standing on top of them probably isn't going to help us. So the thing to do there is actually walk backwards. So at this time, we're going to go in right angle at right angles from the uh, black jack. Um, so, and we keep walking backwards until we can see and compare the gaps between the two. But sometimes the further you walk back, the more the gaps you can see that one is bigger than the other one. In this instance, I think that a visual check of those gaps would make me think I've got to measure that because it's not obvious. So the next stage is always to measure. And what we train our referees to do, and we, we do this from our um, young leaders, young officials rather at schools events upwards, is get into a low and stable position. Now we know that is difficult for some of our referees, but that's, if you get down nice and low, you can really control the calipers or whatever it is you're using. That is why you will see some of our referees that get somebody else out onto the court to do measuring for them. Um, and that is to make sure that they get it right for you, the athletes. And that's the important thing, is that as referees, we want to get it right for you as athletes. So what we're looking for is, uh, in this instance, we might be looking for the score. Um, and what Ian is measuring here is between the jack and the red ball. But you can see quite clearly there are two blue balls that are closer. So in looking for the score there, what he's doing is measuring the nearest red first, and then he can take that measure, which is fixed at that distance, and he can find out how many blues are closer than the nearest red. And that will give him the score. Sometimes if there's two reds that look quite close um, and they look similar distance, you actually have to measure between the two reds to find out which one is nearest and then compare it with the blues. It's quite good for athletes to know that this is the way we do the measuring because if you see something being measured in a different way it's good to watch and see well hang on, do I think they've got the right results here have they measured the right things um, I, I'm sure I'm not the only referee who has once discovered that I was measuring between a red and a blue and I was obviously having a very funny five minutes. I was very glad that somebody pointed it out to me at the time and we had a good laugh. But those things really do happen. Um, and, you know, we all make mistakes. It's a good idea for that reason. If, a, if the referee has invited you onto court to go and have a look at the measure, then, then go and do it. So in this picture it's quite an old picture actually and we've got a, a string measure and actually nowadays where well, we can we use metal measures because the string measures can stretch a little bit um so ideally we use our calipers those are those the, the, the bits that open out um we use the the metal tape measures and if it's really really close we'll use the feeler gauges that have got the different thicknesses of metal that we can put down and or even a torch to see if we can shine between we should be asking for help if we need it. There's various reasons why you might need help. The nearest ball might be two and a half metres away. So you haven't got arms that are that long. Um, you might want somebody to, to cup their hands around a ball to prevent them from being moved. Um, you might have got down on the floor and realised you've got the shakes. You know, there's all sorts of things that could happen. So we do ask for help. Sometimes you'll see a, a timer or a liner that'll come and referee. Sometimes, sorry, a measure. Sometimes a head referee will. Um, and another thing that's really important, and perhaps one of those things that our beginner referees don't always um, remember, is only move balls if it's absolutely necessary. So if you can measure all the balls and not move any of them, that's absolutely the best. If you do have to move them, we always put the paddle so we can see with what Ian's measuring here that the blue is going to be closest. So if we had to move one of those blues, we put the paddle with the blue side up and we put the ball we moved onto the paddle to show that that is a, a scoring ball. 
okay and once that's on the paddle we might end up with two or three balls on the paddle if we've got to move lots um, but we only ever remove the balls we need to and then once we've agreed the score with the um, athletes we will usually replace that that ball back off the paddle to roughly where it was so that when we have our minute and we pick up the jack ball the assistants can turn and have a look at where things were okay again any questions there about the measuring yeah just just whilst we're on it ian's just popped a message and i don't know if you want to come off mute ian um he said he's seen refs remove obviously closer balls while measuring yes so so I, I recall a match I was directly involved with one year, uh, one of the local tournaments. Uh, we had three balls that were very close together to the jack. Obviously, we were all agreed that balls one and two were obviously closer. Yeah. So, so the referee removed balls one and two, and then we're trying to measure ball three and the blue in this case to work out which was closer. Should he have removed the balls in the situation? Well, without seeing it, my, my only thing is if he could measure the other two balls without removing balls one and two, he should have done so. He should have tried to measure. So it might be sometimes you can do it with different devices. So for instance, we can see there's a blue ball just behind Ian's hand here. If you imagine that blue ball was in the middle where the string is, yeah. then using that wouldn't have worked, but actually using calipers might have worked. I'm with you, yeah. So what we, tr we always try and measure without moving anything. And if we can't measure without moving anything, we then explain to the athletes what we're going to do. So now if it was during an end and it was just about finding out who was next, if we don't know, we'll, we might say, if they've asked for the score, we might say it's one and a measure. And then it's up to the athlete to ask if they want it measured or not. Um, or we might say it's, it's very difficult to tell and we might ask the athlete, do you want to come and have a look? Um, those things take up the athlete's time. But at the end, we should always leave the balls in situ if we possibly can. OK, it's not always possible. So what I would then do is to say, um, I need to remove this red ball. Uh, do we both agree? Do we all agree that this is a scoring ball? And you know, it's, it's usually very obvious and everybody will say yes. So you'll then remove that scoring ball as gently as you can and place it onto the, the paddle with the, the side up. Yeah. And I would do the same for each ball that I had to move if I had to move more than one ball out the way. Fabulous. Okay. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. So just gonna go back a little bit. So things we've done so far kind of will work anywhere, but when you get further up the ladder, you start using warm-up courts and call rooms and a little bit to say about each um, i'm not going to go into too much depth although the depth is here on the slide so if you want to come back to the slides in your training and your preparation later you can do so firstly one of the things about warm-up courts that they're very often um, not private so very often people can walk around them you can get to them and all the rest of it and the etiquette really is that if somebody is in warm-up we should respect their space and, and the concentration levels that they have during their warm ups um, and in the call room for that matter. So we don't expect if somebody's in the middle of the warm up, don't go up and chat to them about whether you want to go around for tea on Sunday. You know, that's not the right time. And that's just a little bit about the etiquette of botcher. And those things aren't written down, of course. And then if you want to work out the timings as you as, as an athlete or somebody that you coach, um, involved in the whole build up towards entering the call room and what will happen in there. Um, do you see some previous training I've done? There's a, there's a link here. It's on the uh, Botcher England YouTube site as well. It's called Coaching the Call Room and it takes you through lots of things there. The only thing I would say there is I haven't looked back. Some of the rules might have changed, but most of the processes and timings won't have. Um, so just be aware if, if we mention rules, just to check them in the new rules to check that they're still the same. So what should officials be doing in the call room? Now I'm gonna kind of whiz through this because it's loads of stuff. And arguably as a player, and as long as your official does all these things, you haven't got to bother that much really. So they should 
going from the top left along and then um, left to right on the three lines. Check players and only the right personnel have come to the right court. By the way, in the new rules, an individual player can have a coach with them on court. So that's a new thing um, and something that um, might be helpful for some, might not be for others. Maybe that's something else we need to look at in the future. So they're going to check they've got the right people. They're going to identify the captains if they've got teams and pairs. They're going to do the coin toss. They're going to check equipment. Um, they're going to do a ball check. They're going to seek clarification on how players communicate with the referee and the sports assistant. Um, so it might be somebody uses uh, symbols, um, sign language, eye movements, head movements, whatever, you know. They're going to understand the routines uh, that people have in order to, um, if there's particularly if they've got assistance, et cetera, what are the routines that they do? And they're gonna make sure the liner understands those routines as well. Because if you've got a liner, they're the one most likely to be looking to see that you're doing all the things that you said you were going to do, or you haven't done anything that you haven't been asked to do. They're going to ask about any help you require. So do you need to push out onto the court? Um, when we're out on court, if you want to see that, do you need to be pushed um, out onto the court as well? Again, at the moment, that's something our COVID assistants are doing and our referees are controlling. Um, do, are there any special rules? So sometimes at our beginners events, we may say the first time somebody does something wrong, we're just going to tell them about it. We call that advisory rules. But then the second time it happens, um, we will actually call it. So typical example would be going back to that wheel or foot on the line. First time somebody does it, the referee might say, oh, I'm just gonna stop you there before you throw. You're not allowed to have your wheel or foot on the line. I just go back into your box, that's it now. But if I see it again, I will have to call it. So we need to be able to tell um, players if we're doing something like that or if something's happening. So for instance, I'm afraid on our court, there's a tie break um, and it's gonna go on a bit longer. So that we've moved us to court seven. I'm gonna ask the players if they've got anything to say. They're going to check that the players understand what lies ahead. And I particularly talked here about our BCA athletes. Some of our athletes with um, severe learning disabilities might find it hard to understand all the things that are going to happen. And it's quite good if the referee's got an idea of that. And they're going to create a friendly atmosphere. Now, just have a think for a moment. Think how difficult all those things are to do for somebody who's an international referee. I'm going to bring you back to the national referees and to those who are being mentored in their level twos and to those who have just done their one day course. That is a massive amount of responsibility, isn't it, in the call room or when you meet somebody on court. So as an athlete, I think the call room is your opportunity to make sure that your official knows everything that you need them to know about you. Because this is where if they don't understand all those things, you can get a violation against you. It's a really good example is it if you say every time my sports assistant or ramp operator picks up a ball, I want them to round it. And they're going to every single time. So that's part of my routine. That means I'm not going to tell them. So you might just say ball and your assistant picks it up and rounds it. OK, you might just put your hand up and your assistant picks it up and rounds it. It's part of the routine. You don't have to ask them to do it every time. However, if your official has forgotten to ask about your routines and you forget to tell them about your routines, when you get out onto the court, your assistant picks up a ball and rounds it and you haven't told them to do it. Your referee may think that your assistant is acting under their own, um, doing their own thing, and that's not allowed. The assistant is only allowed to do the things that the athlete has asked them to do. So you could get a violation for that. So I think a good proactive athlete is prepared to tell the, to tell the official all the things they think they need to know. So here we go. Tell them everything you know about your routines. 
Don't give them any grounds to think that you might be trying to get around the rules. OK, so be really, really obvious. Go through it. Um, tell them if you need to be pushed onto court and how you might ask for that to happen. So, for instance, some people in manual wheelchairs might start to try and push themselves and they'll say, as soon as I start to push, though, could you please come and, and push me? So they might not ask at all, but perhaps they're non-verbal. That's difficult to do. Um, or they might ask, is a, it's kind of international sign language for looking would be to maybe go touch near your eye and go out. So I want to come out and have a look. Um, so that might be a, a sign that you use so that when the referee sees that, they need know you need to be pushed onto court. OK, I think it's good that your opponent knows if you're going to ask them to move to the back of their box during your turn. And that's one of those things that is really quite annoying. You know, when you go out and you might have an opponent who just doesn't know it's good etiquette to move to the back of the box. So every time you've got to ask them to move back, sometimes also they don't really kind of know where the back of the box is. So they go back a little bit and, and then you have to ask them again. They go back a little bit more. If you can have that discussion, in the quorum, in front of the referee, the referee knows that you'll go back straight away when it's your opponent's turn and you're asking them to go all the way to the back of their box when it's your turn. And the referee hears that and then sees that you have to ask again and again and again. The referee will usually do something about that. They'll either support you and come and, and wait for the other person to go back they may even sometimes stop the time while the opponent moves back fully in the box and then start your time again. Um, just remember that sometimes, you know, that most opponents who don't move back, it's usually because they, they don't know any better or because they don't um, have a concept of the distance behind them. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it's because people are being deliberately obtuse and that's what the referee is wants to look out for. Okay. Um, make sure that the referee and indeed your opponent know how you're going to communicate with them and, you know, with your sports assistant. And this was an interesting one. In international events, they've started asking the um, assistants to not chew gum because with the assistants were chewing gum, the referees and liners were thinking the assistants were talking to the players because they could see the mouth going up and down. So that's a really interesting one. So if you want to be really professional, don't let your assistants have any gum. <laughs> well, not on court anyway. Um, this, of course, is also your opportunity when you're in there to uh, know, to understand what sort of balls your opponent is playing with. Again, at the moment, we're not doing the whole exchange of balls and, and feeling what the balls are like. But, but once we can again, that really helps you to know um, whether you're playing against very soft balls, very hard balls, therefore, you know, how much of a knockoff you need to make, that kind of thing. Um, that is not on the list of things that the referee has to do. Okay, so you may need to ask, can I, can we see the balls, please? Okay, and offer yours as well. And then the other thing to do in the courtroom is to, to go into court in the best possible mindset and physical condition to win the match. So kind of knowing you've ticked all those things off, you, your referee knows everything about you that you need them to know. You've had that discussion about moving back in the box with your opponent, etc. You kind of, you, what you've done is you've set up conditions that mean things should be easier for you when you get out on the court. It kind of should help with your confidence of, it also makes you look very, very professional and organised. So it, it can quite, um, if you've got a, a newer athlete and you, you're a more experienced athlete, actually sometimes it kind of blows their mind a bit when you go, right, OK, this is what I need you to know about my routines, blah, 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 blah. And you go through all these things you need to do. And um, other people haven't done that. They may feel a little bit um, at a disadvantage. But this is part of your professional behaviours. And these are the sorts of things that uh, an experienced athlete will be in control of. They'll make sure that those things have happened in the call room. Again, any questions there? 
Nothing at the minute, Sandra. Lovely, thank you. I've, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, is, is it a right to inspect your opponent's balls or equipment? That's a very good question. I would have to have a good look in the rules to check that one. I had a, a quite high level match later in 2019 where an opponent very rudely refused to let me see their ball. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't think you can refuse. So I think it is a right. Um, but that's my thinking. And it's maybe one that we need to follow up on. Um, good to we'll know. have a look later on the new rules. Yeah, it's a good question though. But I, I think uh, it's certainly etiquette and I think it's a right. Gotcha, cheers. Okay. So this is just about uh, making sure that you know what's going to happen. Um, did you know, for instance, when you come out of the courtroom, that the, whoever's chosen to be red will parade out onto court first before the person that's, that's uh, in blue? So again, that's not a lot of people don't know that, um, but it, uh, that's what should happen. Okay, it's always the red player first, then the blue player. Uh, usually, the referee will go first, and somebody else will push you if. Uh, you haven't got enough pushes and the referee will push the first person out. Um, you'll see also on the left a player that's been pushed out onto the court during um, the match in order to go presumably to the head. We can't quite see the balls behind there. Um, so a little bit about uh, tie breaks etc at, at the end here, really just so that it's written down for you to have a look at. But again I think really important that you know what's going to happen. So in terms of a tie break, when the final end is over, um, the timer enters the score and the referee makes the coin toss. The referee should invite the player who didn't call in the call room to do the toss, to call the uh, call heads or tails rather. So um, again, Steve was telling us at the, the last webinar that he has a he has an idea for the day. So it might be right today. I'm always going to offer the coin toss to the younger player or I'm always going to um, the one that's got the, I don't know, the first name initial is nearest A in the alphabet or whatever. He'll come up with a thing that helps him to remember which player he's um, has called in the call room. And then he can ask the other one when it comes to a tie break. I think that's quite a useful way. Um, but good for you to know as a player that if your opponent has called in the call room, actually you should be calling uh, for a tie break. OK, um, the referee announces a minute and then the jack of the player that's going first is placed on the cross. And the tie break is played as a normal end and completed in the normal way. With penalty balls, uh, they're played at the end of the end. The score is noted, but not onto the score sheet yet. Uh, the referee clears the court. Again, that might be your COVID assistant that gets asked to clear the court, but the referee will control that. Um, the balls, the set of balls will then be taken to the relevant player or the relevant captain in teams and pairs to say who's going to have uh, any penalty balls. There's a minute to play for each penalty. Um, and the penalty box is now 35 centimetres by 35. So that's substantially larger than it was before. So it's probably a little bit more worth training for penalties now because there's a greater likelihood of scoring from them. Do remember though that on the line is out. Um, and I can't see the very thing at the bottom. Who's going to read out the bottom line for me, please? I can see I've got something written there, but I can't. Penalties, penalties scored, scored added to the end total. Thank you very much. <laughs> so just a note on COVID assistance there before we finish up. So it's really helpful if your COVID assistant can understand the rule for sports assistance that will apply to them too. So particularly about inappropriate communication. So they need to know that you know, when your opponent is playing, they can't have a chat with you because you'll have gone off the court. They'll be off the court. And they may well think they can have a little whisper with you and you know chat about something. That's not possible. You need to make sure they know that. As soon as they talk to you and you talk back, even if it's to say, shush, you're not allowed to talk. <laughs> You've had inappropriate communication. It's happened already. 
Uh, they shouldn't be coaching you, of course, and they can applaud, but we ask really they politely applaud to both sides, not just for you. Uh, they do need to sit behind the, um, you at the side on your side of the court. Interestingly, when we were up in Largs recently, there was actually uh, a COVID assistant who didn't know at all and just kind of sat somewhere around the court and then ended up sitting in the chair that we would provided for our player on their side of the court. So we had to kind of say, um, do you want to move over to your side? You know, <laughs> but of course, if we haven't told them, how are they to know? And your COVID assistants are very likely to be people that maybe don't usually come to events or don't usually assist on court. Um, and they only move to collect balls when the referee asks them to. So um, it may be that the referee has said, when I say a minute, you can come on court to collect the balls. But hopefully the referees will also realise that the COVID assistants are new at this. So I think the referees are being quite good at sort of at saying one minute, uh, COVID assistants, you can come and collect the balls. Um, So that is my little Billy do for you. I have got a slide here which we'll put up at the end about the next lot of training. Um, but if I come out of that at the moment, we can have a chat, we can, can ask any more questions, etc., and, and see how things go from there. Stop sharing. Lovely. So I hope that was helpful. Do by all means take off your um Take your mics. I don't know. What's the word? Unmute. That's the word. Ah. Yes, Sandra, I thought that was very useful for me. I'm, well, I don't play too much now, but I coach and a referee. Paul, who was with us, is, I coach him. So yeah. It's very good for him to learn as well. And it actually refreshes the rules with myself as much as helping the players. So I hope it was a very useful presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, you're welcome. Yeah, that was definitely very helpful. Thank you very much, Sandra. I think as players, we're so we're so ingrained in our little world, we sometimes forget about the other side of the fence, as it were. So that was very helpful. Yeah. These are really kind of holistic skills. It's it's you know, you can you could go on to court, not really know anything about that, play your skills and your tactics and come off court again and just hope that the referees done everything they should in the right way. But actually, the, the more experienced players will have that understanding of what should be done, how it should be done, and kind of, you know, making sure that things are, are nice and fair for them and, and equal, etc. I think also the one thing we do have to be wary of is sometimes, uh, I, I, and I have seen it happen, uh, where, where you see sort of almost, I would call it conflict, when somebody almost violently disagrees with what somebody's just done. So, again, that bit about refereeing, you know, understanding what the referee's done and Explaining was also very helpful, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I can see you're not unmuting. <laughs> <laughs> As your dog's barking. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Anything else that particularly resonated or you thought, oh, well, that's, a, that's a new bit of information I'm pleased to have? I guess again, from a from a coaching perspective, as much from an as from an athlete perspective, I know how it goes for me. But having the reminder of how to teach other people how to get through it is is important and and current. And especially, obviously, only a handful of us got to go to this this pilot thing, and everybody else will be having their their first competition in. Well, for some, it will be nearly three years next yeah. year. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was taking the diary. I funny, funny you say that. Uh, my first competition is the first back to bottom event in Sheffield, which is that one which have worked it out one day shy of three years since my last competition. Wow. Ooh. That's a lot. It is. I really um, liked your slide, Sandra, that, uh, with those prompts about. Um, the, the kind of things that athletes can proactively share with the referees. Yeah. Um, so it was just a reminder to everyone that we will sh share the slides as well afterwards. So you'll have access to, to those notes. Oh, thank you. Real cheers. Thank you very much. Yeah, and some of that stuff about, you know, right at the end about uh, penalty balls and, and uh, tie breaks and things. You know, lots of people know that. But it's actually quite useful just to have it written down sometimes and just to be reminded of it. Mm hmm 
I like to remember that if a ball is being played, then it's a retraction. If there's no ball being played, it has to be a foul penalty. Yeah. Something that's not there. Yeah, I actually just that's I find that really helpful. And then you've only, there's only a handful where it's a retraction and a penalty. Yeah. So you, mm. in a way, you haven't got too much to remember. <laughs> the one I've always struggled with is is at what point you try to tip the ref ref off if your opponent is is causing a violation, because of course you kind of want them to be caught at it so that you get a chance at a penalty. Um, but you don't want to get done yourself for communicating when it's their time. And that's exactly it. There's actually nothing you can do in your time. Yep. So you can you can see it, you can be looking at it. That doesn't mean you know the referee should be looking at them because it's their turn. <laughs> so, but the minute you can is the minute that the ball becomes a dead ball. And that means it's either, sorry, a, a, um, a stopped ball or a dead ball. Either it's gone off the court or it's stopped rolling. And at that moment, the hand can go up and you can um, ask the referee. Yeah, I recently started to do uh, a little bit of te what we're going to call test refereeing ahead of um, at my club ahead of formally doing the qualification when it comes up. Yeah. And I'm finding it from the other side is that as a player, I'm desperately trying not to tell people when they're violating, even though I'm going, I can clearly see the violation and I'm going, you're committing a violation here. Yes. <laughs> That bit of, of standing at the side, knowing you're going to have to intercept any moment, but actually not not tipping forward and <laughs> into it and giving it all away. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah, I've done that. Thank you, Amy, for your comment. Yeah, that was excellent, Sandra. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Um, do you want me to bring the slide back with the next um, training and things on, uh, Natalie? Yeah, you can flash it up on screen if you like, and um, I'll share that on email um, when, when I follow up as well. Um, yeah. I think I popped it in the chat as well. The next session we're running is the 8th of December, yeah. um, which is the first of the new rules ones. So I think a lot of this has crossed over into to, to, the, to rules. So that will be a really good one to follow, uh, follow up on. And we've got two international referees out in Dubai at the moment and more heading to Seville this weekend. So um, we've got lots of expert knowledge coming back from international events uh, who have you know, been, been trialling these new rules. So uh, that session at the start of December will be a really good one for us to, to, to find out how those new rules have gone down and tips on implementing them and, and working with them from either a coach point of view, referee point of view and player uh, point of view. So certainly sign up to that one. Um, if you haven't already, we're repeating it on the 19th of January as well, just to give plenty of people opportunity um, to be involved. Um, and then the Eventbrite link is the is the website where we just keep adding all of these sessions. There's a few more scheduled for uh, February, March time as well. And at any point, if there's there's ideas and suggestions in terms of content that you'd like to see on these evening sessions, then do let me know because we're always trying to um, be inventive and think of new topics that we can we can talk about. But yeah, unless there's any more questions this evening, we will we'll wrap it up there. <laughs>